Welcome to the Next Gen Podcast. Stepping up to the microphone are your hosts, Bryson Wright and Alex Winton. They got next, so let's get to the show. Hello and welcome in everybody to the Next Gen Podcast here on the Bluff City Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Bryson Wright, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alex Winton. And we got a lot of stuff to get through tonight. Going to start with the Grizzlies winning their last two games against the Pistons and the Bucks. Obviously, that Bucks game, to me, was really awesome. I think I, I just enjoyed watching the way the team is in general played. Uh, the Bucks had some guys out as well. But anytime you go on the road to a playoff team like a, to the Bucks, who they still had Giannis playing, they still had Brooke Lopez playing, that was awesome. And then uh, that Pistons game, I think they played really well too, came down to the wire. Uh, but really the biggest thing for me coming out of those games got to be Jaron. Jaron has been playing incredible these last two games. Uh, 40 points against the Pistons, then back coming back with 35 against the Bucks. And I think the most impressive thing, like, I'm willing to say that that game against the Bucks is the most impressed I've ever been by any game Jaron Jackson Jr. has played, like offensively. Because now he's had more points than that before, but it was the fact that he had that 35 points. It was efficient. It was an efficient 35. It was a lot of paint touches, and it was right on Giannis and Brook Lopez the whole game. Like if you really go back and look at all of the shots he made. Most of his shots that he made were either on Brooke Lopez or Giannis Antetokounmpo. And it's like, that is incredible. Like, that's the dude who's one defensive player of the year. And we talked about it all last season. Brooke Lopez was the guy who basically came in, what, second or third for defensive player of the year last year. So this is these are two of the better defenders in the NBA. You have him on – you have them in one-on-one situations. And even sometimes had both of them guarding him, had Giannis guarding him, and Brooke being the help defender or vice versa, you know, that same way. And he, he cooked him. Like he, he was attacking that matchup. It was, you know, between the legs, he was, you know, doing crossovers and stuff. And then he was getting into the paint and he was doing his hook shot. He was making layups over people. He made a step back three in the quarter to ice the game. And it was just like all of this stuff that I just really enjoyed seeing that from him. And, yeah, just seeing him, the way that he attacked that matchup and the way that he's really attacked matchups against the other best bigs in the NBA, uh, I, I've been really happy to see that. Yeah. Um, shout out to Jaren, um, just to start. Um, I think the kind of thing with him the last couple games is is funny because the, like, the game before that, really last two out of three before that, Magic, he only had like four points. I think the Lakers game, he's okay. But the Nuggets game had 11 points. So he's kind of in a, I guess you could say, funk in some type of way. And kind of just um, really, and then again, start with the Piston game, really just asserted himself. I think what he, yeah, he had 40, he had 14 free throws. Again, didn't take it home, took three threes. And again, that was another efficient um, 40 as well. Um, and it was big buckets. Obviously, he did miss that layup. They ended up winning. He, yeah, obviously he did get to the rim uh, and missed that layup. I think it would. I forgot if it would have gave him. Uh, I forgot what how how big of a lead it would have gave him. But either way, he made up for it. They defended, but he did make big plays in that game. And then obviously, like you said, with the Bucks game, um, I will say it was an impressive game just off the simple fact of. I mean, he usually shows up for the honest matchups. I always say that, like for the most part, he usually does. There's only been a couple where I can recall where he either had like real big foul trouble, and like just he was out of rhythm. Um, but like for the most part, he usually shows up for the Giannis matches. I mean, I, I, this is the same dude in the second year that had like his career high against Giannis. Um, I think he had like eight threes that game. I forgot how many he had, but he he had a forty that game too. Um, so it, but this game was really more impressive because, like he said, he really a lot of it was attacking more than the shooting. Um, and so again, like he took six threes, he made big shots, he made the big threes because he made the one in the corner, obviously at the end, which was crazy. I hadn't seen Jaron take a step back, side step three, something like that in a while, it seems like. Then you got the three before that. I think they were up 93-90, and then it was like a pull-up three in transition, basically. But that was a big shot. Um, but like you said with Giannis, like the, it's just the attack mentality with, against him. 
Because I think it was early in the game. I forgot what position it was, but he did like in and out. Bumped Giannis like off a balance and got a like floater. Like he tomato chest to Giannis. I was like, okay, like that's interesting. And then with Brooke, they was look, we was all saying it on Twitter and just in the group chats. Even the commentators saying they listen, Brooke Lopez had no answer for Jaron Jackson Jr. He really had no answer for anybody that night. Like you could Brandon Clark, Gigi Jackson, it didn't matter. But really Jaron, because he was the main matchup. Like he didn't have an answer for anybody. Like it seemed like Jaron was getting to his left. Or basically wherever he wanted to, uh, when he saw Book Lopez, he saw food essentially when he saw Book Lopez. So barbecue um, chicken <laughs> alert, as Shaq would say, barbecue yeah. chicken <laughs> alert. That was going off. Yeah. I, every time he saw, every time he saw Brook Lopez on him, the alarm was going off. Barbecue chicken alert! Come on, go go ahead and get to the bucket. Like it was every time. It it was really yeah. it was really like kind of crazy to watch like in real time. Not to say that. Because we've seen him do that before, but to see him do it on both Giannis and Brooke, like, and not have a Steven Adams out there with him. I know he had BC out there, which we're going to talk about BC, and I think BC played a really good game as well. But it's just like he attacked both of those matchups. And he really set the tone. Like, when you say when he tomato yeah. chest Giannis, like, that was him kind of setting the tone to be like, hey, I lift too. And like Giannis, like that's a big dude. He's like, hey, I, I'm in the gym. I'm like, I'm a big man too. He really like, and when you look at those moves, it was really like the soldier boy. He stole my whole flow. Like that had to be how Giannis mm-hmm. felt, bro. Because he was doing like Giannis stuff. Like he literally was out there. He went to Milwaukee and was like, you know, I'm just gonna play like Giannis tonight. Because that's really how he looked for a lot of the game. Uh, but then he also, with a little bit more finesse, I feel like with the ball handling. But still, like, the way that he attacked the basket and stuff was very Giannis-esque. So it was kind of funny to see him do that against Giannis in Milwaukee. Yeah, no, that that that's that's the funny part about it. It's kind of like he's, like you said, Giannis-type stuff. I mean, he's always been a downhill player, but especially, like you said, a little bit more finesse to handle. But it is funny just because, like, there will be a couple times where, because you know how Giannis will get it back and then he'll just go straight downhill. I remember a couple times they – like Jim would have a dribble, he throw it to somebody, he get right back downhill. So it was, it was very funny how how, how a lot of that played out. And uh, there was a couple, and he had, I want to say he had four assists. Uh, so and there, there, those were some really good, some really good passes. Obviously, his passes t- taking a leap this year, but there were a couple passes where it's like, okay, like this is kind of I want to say Giannis esque, but again, like just using the same way. They both play the same position. Obviously, Giannis is more of a dominant player, but Jaron does have tendencies of being able to dominate games like this and like i said earlier or i said it on twitter third option jaron next year will be sit will be special because again he'll be the third main option on this team and teams are worried about john morant and desmond bain and oh hey i'm just jaron jackson jr as a third guy like <laughs> that's gonna be kind of a problem for teams and we saw it earlier when they were all together um and they and, and again you think that is going to continue and get better along with the roster yeah it's going to be it's going to be scary, man. It's going to be scary because, again, uh, even in spite of the season, how it's gone, Jaron has played a lot of games. He's played 66 games. You know, people didn't give him, you know, obviously continue. You know, he there's been concerns about his health, obviously, in the past. And, you know, again, there still can be concerns with all three of them. But, like, he's starting to beat that narrative or agenda about him that he can't stay healthy. Um, and not only that, I think he's gotten better in a lot of areas. So where when he is the third option, a lot of those things will pop a lot better um, next season. So, yeah, no, shout out to Jaren. Yeah, definitely. And I think when he is back in that role, you'll see him be, like, even more efficient. Like, the efficiency he's had these last couple games. I know this year his efficiency has been worse than last year. But, I mean, he's just he's doing so much more with the ball in his hands. It's kind of like you would expect that. Uh, the way he played last year is, like, the best version of himself, I think just because he's not necessarily the number one off the option on offense, like you're saying, and he can be the third guy and John and Bain can do a lot of the offensive stuff. And then it's co- almost like, Oh wait, you look up and Jaron still somehow has 20, but he was the third option. Like, I feel like that was the kind of games we were getting from him last year where he might've only had 16, 17 points, but then on the other end, he's doing so much defensively and you know, he has four or five blocks and that 18 points is on eight shots, you know, and it's just 
crazy stuff like that, which I think we will see more of that. And I think the main thing for him is with everything this season is for him to continue to stay healthy. He's really been the only person on the team that's been healthy. Like in terms of he, he's missed a couple games here and there, obviously. But at the end of the day, like he's going to be the only, I think he might be the only player, especially in terms of like, obviously between him, John Bain, but even if you go down to like smart Vince Williams, Jr., even Santi has missed a lot of games. Like he's been like basically the most consistent player on the team in terms of availability this year. And you could really argue that it was the same way last year after that first 15 games. I mean, he missed the first like 15 games of the season. And then I think he only missed one game once he actually came back. So it's one of those things where as long as he stays healthy throughout the rest of this year, he's going to have another off off season under his belt where he can build off of everything he's been doing this year. And I don't know. I just feel like we are going to see a even better version. Like, like he's only 24. And I think people like forget about that because it is year six, but it's like, dude, he's, well, he's going to be going to his seventh year in the NBA. And he's only going to be 25. Like this is when, guys are supposed to start hitting their prime. And so everything we saw before this was before he hit his prime. And you can't tell me that it's like the more, I think like from a mindset thing too, I think he's much smarter just overall too. Like you can see it on both ends. Uh, The foul trouble is still something that does kind of mess with him from time to time. It hasn't been as bad as it has been in years past. He'll have stretches where it's bad. But I think offensively and the way that he's making reads and the way he's making the right pass, I think that's something that we hadn't seen from him in the past. Yeah, and to your point about the games played, I looked it up earlier just because I was curious. He's played almost the same amount of games as Ja, Bain, and Smart combined. Like, I think he's at 66, and I think they played together total. I think it was like 71 or 72. So just for perspective, he has been the most. He and, and he has played the most games. I think Santi's number two in that. But outside of that, it ain't like it's like most people are like at forty or fifty games. Everybody else, he's the only one that's played. It's kind of again, it's kind of like we. Were, I think I said it on Twitter. Well, I don't know if I said it on Twitter or here. I can't remember. But it's kind of like when Mark, and we'll, we'll get to him later because obviously what, what's going on Saturday. But Mark, as I think it was the. I think it was the season before we got Jaron when, when we were like 22 and 60. Mark was like the only guy that played like 70, 60 games. That's how Jaron is now. Basically, essentially like the one dude, the, the the constant that's been playing in these games regardless when they were good for a little bit or when they were bad. Then they had moments of being good. Then they were bad again. So, like, yeah, no, it's 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 funny. But, yeah, no, he's going to continue to get better, obviously. This is – and, again, they're all hitting their primes in the, around the same time. Obviously, Baines and his prime now he's 25. I guess you could count it, but yeah, him and Ja are still 24. We'll be 25 going into next season. So, like again, these guys are still young. Like that's the whole point of all this. That's why the future is not super bleak because it's not like these guys are like old and over the hill. It's like these guys have room to still grow in little areas, and even if they're just little incremental improvements, that can help when everything is full. Like the, you know, when the picture's full, everybody's healthy and everything. So. Yeah, no, Jaren, there's some positives to take away from Jaren. Because, again, like I said, if he continues to pass the way he did this year, and then obviously you clean the fouls a little bit more, and you rebound a little bit better, obviously. I'm not asking for eight. You know, I'm not asking like 10 rebounds a game. But can you get to mark level rebound in like seven or eight a game? And with all the NBA defense, I think that's a really scary player as a third option. Most teams don't have that type of third option. Most third options in the league are like, you know, 18, 20 points a night, but they're not 18, 20 points a night in defensive player of the year in the back line of your defense. Like, that just doesn't happen. Not a lot of defensive player of the year guys are, um, you know, 20 point, 25 points per game sports. They are the superstars, like like a Giannis or like an Anthony Davis, like those type of guys. So you're talking about a dude who's that, and those are older guys. Not older, older, but they're in, in their prime prime. Like you said, he just now reached his prime. So, you know. There should be more respect on Jaren's name. This is the only word, the only place that there's not respect on Jaren's name is Twitter. But I mean, Twitter's for jokes and stuff. But, you gotta <laughs> but Twitter, yeah. you know, Twitter's for jokes. But, but people know how good Jaren is. Like, yeah, I think that sometimes, like, I mean, 
people in general, and like I, I'm not gonna say I've never done it myself. Like you can let social media let people like it change your perspective on a player or change how you think people are viewed on a player. But like I'll just go ahead and say this: some of the stuff you people say that you see people say on Twitter or whatever social media site it is, there's a reason they're saying it on there. Because if they said it at the game, people would look at them and be like, what are you talking about? Like, there's a reason why they're saying it on there and they're not saying it in public and they're not saying it to these people's face. Because they know that most of the time people be looking at them like, what are you talking about? Uh, it's one of those things where it's like, that's basically what the internet is for. The internet is for people to comment on stuff they don't fully understand. Like, that is basically what the internet is made for. That would be That's like my definition of social media. So, like, just in terms of that, sometimes you just, like, it's funny, like, if you see somebody after Jaron, like, cause there's there's a couple. I, I, I've never, I'm not going to name names and stuff like that. But if you go in there after Jaron got 35 and you still are talking about, like, he's not good, like, did you not watch, like, did you not just see the game? Like, there is no way anybody can come away from that game and be like, he's not a good basketball player. Like what? It's yeah, he's it, trash. It, yeah, yeah he's trash. he just had thirty five on Giannis. He's trash. Uh, but I did want to talk about BC too, uh, because I mean Brandon Clark just this and what has happened so far is why I wanted him to come back is mostly just because I wanted to see how like athletically like how he looks as, as an athlete because so much of his game like obviously he's high IQ player he has the floater and all that. But so much of his game is about his ability to jump up and get offensive rebounds and his hustle plays and his athleticism. And with that Achilles injury, like, obviously, you know, we have modern medicine and stuff like that, where the Achilles injury obviously is one of the most devastating injuries in sports still to this day. But it's not it doesn't end careers as it once did. Like we've seen Kevin Durant towards Achilles. You know, he was averaging 30 and came back and was averaging 30 again, right? Now, that's KD, and obviously Brandon Clark is in KD, but it's like we've we've seen players come back from this now, and these last two games really uh, is exactly what I need to see from Brandon Clark. I mean, I think he had 14-7 and seven against the Bucks, and he had 15-7 and seven against the Pistons. If Brandon Clark is averaging 15-7 and seven next year or 15-8, and eight, the Grizzlies are going to be a very good team. I mean, like, if he can, it, and it's just like his energy, you can almost, you can like feel his energy has kind of gone throughout the team too. Cause I mean, you also had Gigi Jackson had 12 rebounds. Jordan Goodwin had 12 rebounds. And it's like just that added presence of him being there. I feel like the whole team has kind of, they've kind of rallied behind that. And I think they've had, uh, but they've been playing more kind of Grizzlies basketball since Brandon Clark has been back. They've been attacking the paint more. Uh, I think they had like 76 paint points against the Bucks, which is like ridiculous. Like they were attacking the rim at such a high level. And a lot of that was because of Brandon Clark as well. Uh, so I'm just glad that he looks like the same player that he was before the injury. Like there hasn't been anything that I've seen where I'm like, okay, he's lost a step or he can't jump or he can't do that. So I'm feeling good about their decision, especially to keep BC throughout all this. Uh, and hopefully he'll be able to come back next season as well and continue to build off this. But yeah, so far it's like, like we said, I think a couple episodes ago, talking about the end of this season being a launch pad for his off season. I think that he's definitely gaining the confidence that I was hoping he would. And I think his touch, like his touch around the basket has been, like, I feel like that's the thing that is easiest to lose when you don't play for a year. Obviously, he's shooting around. He still has a kind of a feel for the game. But it's so different when you're actually in the game. And I think seeing him still have that touch, still have that floater, hitting a little mid-range jumper, like all that kind of stuff, like the more, like the the, the, the little things that he's that he's been doing. And I, I'm just excited that he, like I said, he looks like the same BC he looks like he can still, you know, come back from this and be a better player. Uh, I'm just really glad. because It, it just shows how hard he's worked in this offseason, uh, his rehab, the whole year and everything. It just showed how, how hard he's really worked to get back. 
And I'm just I'm really just happy for him. Yeah. Um, first off, I want to say I, I, I want to thank BC because he's making me look smart, very smart. And I said this, I, don't, I can't remember how long ago. I, I think I said it on Twitter. Well, I said it on Twitter. I said it on here. I said it before. I don't want to, I'm not trying to bring him up just to, you know, talk down on him. But I remember, you know, people talking about, because I, I was a big proponent of, you got two guys, him and Bre- or Stephen Adams, two guys that were coming off major injuries. And I was like, look, you're going to choose one, you're going to choose BC. Play look, be Shoney be a playoff player. And plus, like I said, I expect him to be good still. Now I know people worry about you know him athletically, which I kind of understand, but I want to say this about his game, which is what I was saying a couple weeks ago or a week ago or however long ago. He's athletic, but people like slept on him as a I his IQ and his touch around the rim. While he was like it's kind of the thing of how can I say it? His athleticism enhanced his game, but it didn't make his game. It wasn't like he was just some lob threat guy and all he did was dunk. Like, no, he had dunks, had highlight plays, but that wasn't – if people watched the actual game, that was not his whole game. That's just a little moment in the game. It's kind of like – I'm not saying he's John Morant, but it's kind of like with John. People watch the highlights and see him just dunk, but not understand he's one of the smartest players in the league, top ten pass in the league, all this other stuff. Like, he got a good floater. Like, there's more to his game than just the highlights. But people – only see the highlights sometimes. Like, oh, he caught a lot. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's, and he's a role player. So they're not understanding that. And so for me, that's why, again, you know, I said it yet last night. I'm not, ne- let me say this. I'm not, I'm surprised by certain things about BC playing this well, but I'm not surprised that he looks like himself. Like in the sense of like, he's playing well and doing the same things. Like you said, athletically, he looks the same. I felt like there were a couple moments where I felt like, well, I'm, he's not watched, but I like to call players watch this to be funny. Like there was one time, I think it was during the Orlando game, where he could have dunked it, but or like old BC, that's a dunk, but it was a layup. And I was like, okay, like certain little things. He's not getting high, crazy off the ground. Like there's a couple blocks last night he had. Like they were good blocks, but like I remember BC being able, able to be higher on the blocks and it mean more, you know, be more emphatic. But that's okay. Like some of that might just be he just getting back. Or it might just be the same, but either way, or it's fine. Like he's still an effective player, obviously. And the thing, me, I'm more surprised that the rust, like the adjustment, like basically him being rusty wasn't that long. It was the first game. Like if I'm, I'm looking at it right now, he had six points in that first game, five was I think was that five rebounds, and he shot 42 percent in that game. He only took seven shots, but after that, he shot 66 percent, 58 percent, 70 percent, and it's been double digits every game after that. I mean, it's a small sample size, four games, but still. Like, I'm more surprised by that, and I think the real big thing for me is the willingness to take jump shots. He's only taking, what, a a three a game every game? But, I mean, he took a couple mid-range jump shots in these games. He took a mid-range jump shot last night. Like, him doing that is more surprising, like him more willing, because the last two, three years, we haven't really seen BC shoot a lot of jumpers outside of, like, his first, like, his rookie season. After that, he stopped looking at the basket once he got past, like, 10 to 14 feet. Like, he's looking, like, you know, like DHOs and stuff like that. But now he's starting to look at the basket. And I feel like that's an element. I'm not saying he's got to add. Like, I'm not saying he got to shoot seven threes a game. I'm not at, please, that's not his game. But I'm simply saying, look, if that could be another added thing where he shoots like two, maybe three threes a game, and you give me like one or two of those, that adds value to the offense. It makes you with more of a threat that might add a little bit more floor spacing. So those are the things I say are surprising. But again, I'm not really surprised because, like I said, he's a high IQ player. His touch was never going to go away. Like you said, the touch can go away from a year, which is why I thought he's going to be rusty. But I didn't think he's going to lose his touch all, you know, all of a sudden. And really, like a big thing is modern medicine. Like people got to understand, it's not like he came back from the Achilles injury in like six months, eight months, which is what older Achilles injury people used to do. They used to come back in like six, eight months, like nine months. Now most people don't come back for a year, like ACL, and you see them be effective. Like you said, Kevin Durant, he didn't really miss a beat. And obviously, again, that's Kevin Durant. He's not Kevin Durant, but you can see Kevin Durant still be a serviceable player, actually top 10 player. And Clay Thompson is another one where I know, you know, obviously people like to make jokes about Clay, and I do too. I'm a big proponent of making good jokes about Clay, but a lot of his stuff is age anyway, and also the shot selection. Um, and even then, he's still like, you go look at his numbers and splits, like he's not like a terrible player. Like, it's not bad. And he looked decent enough, like when he first came back, to be effective enough for a couple of years after. So, like, and again, like another player I named, Dwight Powell, came back from the Achilles injury, was effective for a couple years after that. And he was older than 
we BC. BC still 27. We're going to be 28. So I say all that to say, like, Brandon Clark's going to be fine. I'm not really too surprised that he's doing this. I'm surprised that it happened this soon, but I'm not surprised that he's doing it. I expected this. That's why I was like, hey, you need to pick him to be the guy. And, again, real quick, him and Jaron, that combo still is really effective. Like, it just it never misses. It don't matter what. They could play 10 minutes together. It's probably they're probably gonna be like plus 30 in them minutes. Like they, I think I, I forgot what shot to Sean Coleman. He had a tweet about it. As, I think a small sample size of it. They were like the numbers are great. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the numbers are great. And I'm not really surprised because they always used to play together well. And I think BC said after the game, like he missed playing with Jaron, but missed just playing in general. And he, you know, he felt like he never really left, he said, just because of you know, just being around the team all the time. So, like you said, I'm happy for him because he worked hard to get back and play these games. But that's why I was always pro. He should play the games, but not only him, but Bane come back. And, you know, guys, if they can play, play. Because, again, like I said, we've been saying it's all about setting things up for next season. So, like, this is going to help him going into next season. And, you know, if he looks like this, and, again, I'm like, you know, right now, imagine what he's going to look like with the offseason, healthy and not rehabbing. I'm not saying he's going to be an all-star, but a good serviceable player, yeah, he's going to be good. Like You can, sit, you can look at him and be like, okay, he can still be part of this playoff rotation when we get there next year, you know, because that's the goal. So, you know, you're trying to find a playoff eight to ten guys, or really eight. So, And I still think he'd be part of that. Yeah. So, yeah shout definitely. out to No, nah, because – and I think, like, going into next season, right, I mean, he's definitely in that playoff eight. Because, you know, you're going to have Ja, you're going to have Bain, Smart, Vince, I'd have Gigi in there, Jaron, yep. BC, uh, Kennard, as, as long as he comes back, most likely. And then probably whoever is picked in the lottery this year, based on how they play throughout the season, will probably be in that eight. And then that's when you kind of get into, like, the Santis, where Asante going to be, stuff like that kind of lower. But, like, I think that as of now – BC is definitely going to be in the playoff rotation if they make it next year and he's healthy. Like, there's not a question about that. That's the level of player that he is and that he can be. Uh, so that's why I said, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he's looked good and just, I just want to see him continue to build. I think there's what five, four or five games left. Like just get out, stay healthy, continue to do what he's been doing, play his game. And I think the Grizzlies are going to be all right. Uh, but kind of like switching gears from the current team, we got to talk about Mark Gasol and his jersey retirement coming up. Mark Gasol, I know the same for Alex. Mark Gasol is one of my favorite players. Like, will always be one of my favorite players just because of the age that I was when he got to the Grizzlies. I was like eight, nine years old, right? So, and... At the time, this obviously I, I I was I've always been a taller dude, so I was playing center for my little league team, and I used to watch Mark, and I'd be like, I'd be trying to play like Mark. I want to shoot a little mid range jumper. I'm trying to make bounce passes to people, probably going out of bounds, but I was trying. Shoot, I'm trying to make these little post bounce passes and stuff. They'd be like, What you? What are you? It's like, oh, I saw Mark saw do that last night. Now I'm trying to do all that kind of stuff, like Mark, and I will say. Like, Mark Gasol, I'm not saying he's as good as Jokic, but, like, Mark Gasol walked so that Jokic could run. Well, really, Mark Gasol ran so Jokic could fly. We'll say that because Mark was doing his thing, too. But, like, Mark was, like, the first – like, he, he never got as far as Jokic has, obviously, and in terms of how, how great of a shooter Jokic is and the era that he's in now. But you could also argue the same way that on the defensive end, I mean, Mark was even better. Like, Mark was the best defender in the league, arguably, for a few years. I mean, it's not like he was the most athletic dude or whatever, but just in terms of the the way that he understood the defensive side of the basketball and, like, what guys wanted to do, uh, when to trap <laughs> – when to trap in the pick and roll, when to play drop coverage – when to switch like it's, it's just like he always knew he knew when somebody was going to do their spin move he knew where to be on help defense it was just like he it just felt like he was always in the right place like regardless of what it was especially on the defensive end and then seeing him develop offensively obviously starting like the mid-range jumper and everything the passing 
is just insane. Like, until Jokic, I would still argue that he was one of the best passing big men ever, like, if not the best. Because he was, like, the the passes that he was making um, were just, like, it was, it was something that you usually didn't see from a lot of big men, especially in that time period. So just to see the way that he grew into, like, a real player, uh, it was just awesome to see. And I watched the documentary – was also cool just because you got to see, like, how important Memphis really was to him. Because, I mean, he got to Memphis when he was 15, 16 years old, uh, playing high school basketball in Memphis and everything like that. And it's funny, he he's so Memphis that it's like when you hear him talk, like, he talks with a Spanish Memphis accent. Like, I've never, I've never seen this before. I, like, I've never seen, like, it, and it's like, I feel like you hear it more now even than you did when he was on the team. Because I remember hearing him talking, you would hear it sometimes. But, like, when he was on the Chris Vernon show, I watched that clip, and he was talking about him. I was like, nah, you really from Memphis. This man's out here This man out here talking about I was going to have to make some calls in Frazier when that video came out. And I was like, wait. I was like, that man is really from Memphis. Like, and it, you, you can hear it in his voice. You can hear it just, like, in who he is. And that's why I love talking about the documentary – and we can talk. We're gonna talk about a lot of stuff in the documentary, but I just had to start with just saying, Mark Gasol. I'm so happy to retire in his jersey, uh, just because he's 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 one of my favorite players ever. Yeah, um, yeah. No, Mark, man. Listen, Saturday is gonna be great. That's, I'm gonna start by saying that Saturday is gonna be very great. I will I will be tuned in. Um, but yeah, no, Mark. Again, like for me, obviously with Mark, like. Like to your point, one of my obviously the core four just in general, one of my favorite obviously growing up, like again, you know, what, twenty-five now, when core four is really going around, like I was like teenage years for real. Like for real teenage years, that's like my team growing up. So I was like, yeah, that's kinda it's kinda crazy looking back at it now. It makes me feel a little bit old because I'm like, ah. And I know that they was talking about it on Chris Burns show. They make it it's they see Mike still playing, make you feel old or makes them feel old. Makes me feel a little bit old too, because like everybody else is retired. And I'm like, dang, that's kind of crazy. So, but you know, Mark, man, listen, um, nobody can really ever make me dislike Mark Gasol again. We'll talk about the documentary stuff, but like with Mark, um, just him essentially, uh, like you said, uh, again, I want to say Jokic before Jokic, but like he did a lot of the Jokic type of stuff as a big, um, and obviously to seeing where he, how his career ended up, obviously he ended up in Memphis and. You know, or he wasn't was in Memphis early, left to play overseas, then came back, and then grew into the player that, you know, most didn't expect him. I mean, even though his brother thought he was going to be good and people thought he was going to be good, nobody expected him to be one of the best franchise players of all time. Like, nobody thought that probably when he was younger. You know what I mean? Some people, like, we'll talk about it, documentary. Some people didn't expect him to even be, like, a professional or college player and for him to grow into what he's grown into. Because I think, again, like you said, defensively, he's one of the smartest, more smarter players. But in general, he's like high basketball IQ is like high off the charts, both ends. And again, I think that's why um, you know a lot of his, you know, some of his criticism is because of you know, or people that criticize him was because he played too much the right way, um, or played too because he wanted to, you know, get others involved and wanted to move the ball. And that was to a detriment. I, I think he even said in the clip that was not in the – well, it was a clip for the doc, but it didn't. they didn't put it in the doc. But he's basically saying he played too much the right way to a fault because he should have been more aggressive at times. But that was just him, and that's what made him him, and that's what made him one of the better players in the league because of the IQ. Because like you said, defensively, like as I talk about bigs today, like if you got slow feet for the most part or you can't play in space, it's going to be hard for you. And you look at Mark, it's probably hard for him to play in space. But his IQ made it, negated his, you know, what he didn't, what he lacked in athleticism, he made up for an IQ. Um, and so for for Mark to be, obviously, um, one of the better players in the franchise's history and still be around, obviously, not around as much, but still, like he says, he keeps up with the team. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, he still has a connection with Jaren because Jaren was the last player to have, kind of be the transition from that era. Um, you know, I, again, I, I just, again, shout out to Mark, man. It, again, that's not even to mention what he did off the, the floor. Like, you know, he's a good dude. Like I was saying, uh, when I was watching the doc, like just 
just a good dude in general, good player. Like, shout out to Mark. Like, I, I, I had nothing bad to say about Marcus Song for real. Like, I really don't. Like, again, those guys, even though they didn't, again, like, well, we still got to get Tony and Mike retired, but, you know, the jerseys retired. But even though they don't win a championship, like I always say, they set the foundation for what it is today. Like, because they didn't have an identity. They didn't have a culture yet before Mark and Tony and Zach and Mike. Like, they had three playoff series and lost all four, all, like, lost every game before that. Like, they had no identity for real. Like, they were, I want to say a laughing style, laugh style, but like, people didn't take them as serious as a franchise. And then from day one when he got there, and then the year after that you get Zach, and then the year after that you get Tony, you add everybody, and, and then add, they go on a seven-year run, even though it wasn't that didn't lead to a championship. Again, it set a standard for what it is now because now you got Ja, Jared, and Bain, and obviously they a uh, way different team, but his play, or Mark's play, along with the other three, set the standard for what it is today. And so now, you know, they have something to – you know, they have a, a type of culture that they can look at and be like, hey, that's how we – that's the standard. You know what I mean? And so you got to have some type of – something to look at to be like, you know, have an example of to be like, okay, this is how we need to be night in, night out. Um, and they said that. So, um, yeah, Saturday is going to be a great day. Obviously, I'm ready to watch it. Um, and, yeah, Mark was great. So, you know, I got nothing but love for Mark. I got jerseys of Mark. I don't really buy jerseys. This is the last thing. I don't buy jerseys a lot, like NBA jerseys at all for real. Like, unless you're my favorite players or, like, my top all-time favorite players or you're part of my favorite team. That's usually when I buy your jersey. And I bought a, a, a Mark jersey. Two, I think I got two of them, I think. One or two. I can't remember how many. I had to go look. But either way, I you I really got messaged you to get a jersey. So, shout out to Mark, man, because, uh, yeah, nah, he's he's great. He's great. He's 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 a Memphis legend forever. Ain't ain't no – he ain't got no problem with me. Yeah, no question about that. Uh. The documentary, I thought it was pretty cool. I don't know. The most, like, I'll say the most surprising cameo to me in the documentary was Kevin Durant. Like, when Kevin Durant popped up, I was kind of like, wait, oh, okay. Like, they got KD, to, they got because, I mean, but KD's a big part of the story. I mean, those get those Thunder series were huge. That's another thing that just shows, like, how long KD's been in the leagues, too, because that was – like 11 years ago, and he's still doing all this. But I thought that was really cool. Uh, Chris Wallace was whatever. He he was on there. Good for him. Like, I'm just <laughs> – the whole – and then the whole thing that when they're talking about – like, the reason why I say it like that is because they were talking about on the documentary where when the Grizzlies had the second pick and they, they picked the beat, they already had Mark, and Mark was already, like, playing like a starting level center. And then they drafted the beat, and then Mark was just killing the beat in the tank training camp. And I was just like, dang. I know that day he was like, I made a mistake. Like, he had to see, he was like, I made a mistake. And then to hear Lionel Hollins come on there and say that he asked Chris Wallace to trade back and take Steph Curry. I wish he didn't even tell me that. Like, I almost <laughs> wish I didn't know that. I could have gone my whole life without knowing that. But I'm like, dude, you had the blueprint. You had the blueprint, but that's – they could have had Steph or James Harden, man. Really, really, I think Harden is the one that hurts me more than Steph because you can't tell yeah. me – if the, bro, if the grit and grind – like, I love Tony Allen, and I'm sure they would have had Tony Allen still somehow, some way, and Tony Allen could have joined the team. But you can't tell me – if you would have had, I mean, you could have had Mike Harden, T.A., Zebo, and Mark be your starting five. Like, come on, man. That like that that would have helped so much of their issues in terms of shooting, in terms of offense. Uh, so that was the only part of the documentary where I was almost like, dang, I almost wish I didn't even. I don't even want to know that. Like, I don't even. I, I hate thinking about that draft. Like looking back at it. Because obviously at the time, like I said, that was what like two thousand nine. I think yeah, two thousand nine. So, like, at the time, I didn't really understand. I was like, oh, we got number two. Like, cool. Because I was, like, I was in, like, third grade. Like, I wasn't looking at it like that. But now looking back and looking at who they could have got, I'm like, dang, they really could have, like, they could have done something with that pick. Even if they had traded that, traded it for something else. But, and then, yeah, but I will say, the one thing I can give uh, Chris Wallace is he did own up to his mistake 
that was the first thing he said. He was like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have drafted the beat. Uh, but yeah, but still, even with all that, I think just see like, and I think it, the, the, the whole documentary kind of captured how he was very important, even though the Grizzlies never ended up winning at all with Mark. It was almost like they went from they had never won a playoff game to where now it went from if you saw the Grizzlies, you'd be like, oh, the Grizzlies, whatever. Like, that's how it was when, you know, in the, in the 2000s, really. Like, even when they did make the playoffs, it's like, oh, it's the Grizzlies. They're not going to do nothing. Whereas then it became like in the mid-2010s, like, I'll tell you one thing. Nobody wanted to play them in the first round or the second round. If you could avoid playing the Grizzlies, because, look, you might win the series, but you're not going to feel good about it after. <laughs> like, you are going to be sore. They're going to hit you. They're going to take you to the paint. Like, you, you're not getting any easy buckets. You're going to be getting deed up by Tony Allen. And then if you get past him, you got Mark Gasol standing, at, standing under the rim. And that's kind of what Tony was talking about is I could play defense harder because I know Mark's back there. Uh, and they had, like, one of the best defensive teams ever. Just – in terms of all that. So I was like, and they talked about, you know, Mark winning defensive player of the year and how he also did kind of usher in some of these advanced metrics that people look at like all the time now. Whereas like, I don't even see like defensive rating and stuff, which at the time was like, oh, well he has one of the best defensive ratings in the NBA. People would be like, what does that even mean? Like what? Whereas now it's to the point to where like, I don't even think defensive rating is really that advanced of a stat anymore. <laughs> like, yeah. In terms of all the other stuff they get, it's really, like, that's almost, like, a counting stat at this point. Like, it's not quite the same as, like, to that level. But uh, amongst people who watch the NBA consistently, a lot of people at least understand what that means and understands that if you're in the top 10, 15 of that, you're really good on defense, whether it's your team or a player. Yeah, of course. The doc is great. But I want to start out by saying this. When I saw Chris Wallace, and y'all people know how I feel about Chris Wallace. The same how I feel about – I'm bringing up football. This is how I feel about Titans, oh, GM, John Robson. And both mm-hmm. of these – I have a strong dislike for both these men. And a lot of it is I just I just don't like them because they, they, they wasted away good players and they, they used. Not saying they didn't do good things. But they struck lightning in a bottle, and it gave, it gave them a lot more time than they should have had. As soon as I saw Chris Wallace, he started talking about everything. It had to just be 2009. When he started talking about, hey, we got to get um, – or he tried to get Mark, Mark in the draft, and they wouldn't budge on that. And he tried to move up. The clips of him actually trying to get him up is funny because he's like, I tried to I call, – he called Powell. was like, hey, we couldn't get him. Then Powell talking about, hey. We try to, hey, I'll take money out of my salary just to give, just to get my brother here, and they didn't want to do it. And then on top of that, you get to the trade deadline, and you do one of the worst trades in NBA history, and you give up Pau Gasol for a bag of chips, two first rounders, and two players that didn't even make the team. At the only person was Mark, and and you needed Pau to convince Michael Hinesley, hey, that hey, this is a really good deal. The former owner of the Grizzlies, uh, like you had to convince him to be like, hey. Should I pay him this money? And Chris Wallace, you know, saying thank God because he was going to look crazy. Like, all that just brought back PTSD and trauma that I had as a fan. Because like you said, you don't understand it at the time. You don't. You don't. Not when – I didn't really fully understand it till closer to the end. Like, 2017, like the last year of the core – like, 2017, 2018, or 2016, 17. I didn't really realize till the end. I was like, bro. And then really after – once we got to here – as I as I got older, I'm like, this dude really don't. I won't say wasted or wasted away, but man, there's a lot of stuff. Like people don't understand that this is how good the core four was. You just needed them four to be healthy majority of the season, and you were gonna make the playoffs. It didn't matter who you had on the floor. You could have G Leaguers next to them, and they were gonna make the playoffs. That's how good they were. But that's how it shows you how bad the roster construction was. Because people go look at that 16, 17 roster. I really want y'all to go see it. I know we get Fizdale because they talked about the Fizdale stuff and, you know, how him and Mark didn't get along and, you know, he tried to do different things. And I understand that's part of it. But go look at that roster, too. That roster was not great. They still made the playoffs. And then, uh, again, another years before, when uh, I think 
was that Mark got hurt, broke his foot, and then Mike got hurt, and they still made the playoffs. That was the year where they had like 26 players played, and they still made the playoffs. Now, Grizzlies, same this year, but they didn't make the playoffs. But they had like 30 some people play this year. Like, all that stuff, like just looking back at all that stuff, it, yeah, it gave me a lot of trauma just for Chris Wallace, just to start. But outside of that, just looking at basically the growth from Mark to rookie year to now or to his whole career, just going back over that whole thing, reminiscing, like, it, it, it was crazy. Just It was good to reminisce because, I mean, obviously you look back at that stuff, but just to see it again and watch it and sit down with it and just focus on that, you really look at that. It's like, dang, that's crazy how all that happened and how it happened, when it happened. You know, you remember. Because, again, like, I was a child. So, like, like you said, like, I was younger. So, like, obviously I was paying attention, but you don't really look back at it. Or, like, you don't know in the moment until you – Look at it in hindsight, and so like looking at back at all that was pretty cool to see. Um, really, the, the the cool stuff was like you said, like seeing this growing up as a child, and then having to go, you know, you know, from overseas to here, then going back, coming back, and then you know playing well, and then you know showing like the his, you know when they talked about like his best year was like you know I think it was the fourteen fifteen year where he made first team on NBA, and I pretty much agree with that, you know, and then like his welcome to the, or not. In, but his breaking out series was like the series against San Antonio when they beat him as an eight. He, I think he averaged like I, and I went back and looked at these box scores too. I'm like, man, he was fine. Like, especially that 2013 year. And, uh, when we went to the conference finals, he was frying the thunder in the, uh, the Clippers, especially the thunder. I think he had like four straight 20 point games. He was flying them. I'm like, like, hey, like, I mean, I knew Mark was like that. Don't, don't get it twisted, but still, you know, for a guy to play the right way, 20, like, he much rather score, like, eight points a win. So, you know, when you see him have, like, 20, 20 points, like, eight rebounds, two blocks, you know, um, it's just stuff like that, you know, it's great to see. Even the good and, the, like, even the bad. Like I said, just to see, you know, the beat there. They talked about the beat. And like Mark said, I took the – like, hey, like the MJ meme, he took it personal. Took it very personal and, and, and dogged him. And I get it. I understand. Because, listen, like you said, they could have drafted anybody else. And you – I'm not even gonna talk about it. I'm not even gonna break it up. I'm just gonna forget it happened. All right. We we just gonna look past it and not just remember it didn't happen. I try not I try to forget. I try to forget. But it was great to see the documentary. A shout out to Michael Blevins, who works with the Grizzlies, who makes these stuff. Because he had a good documentary with Zach last time. And I think obviously with Tony and Mike, when they get their documentary, it's gonna be the same type of work. It was a great documentary. Because now and they didn't just focus on the basketball stuff, they focused on the stuff that he did outside of it. Like it was cool to see him, like the St. Jude stuff where you see patients that were there when they were younger. You saw pictures of them, and you see them older, and they're talking about Mark now. Um, and then um, I think when he went to the Mediterranean to save those people that were in the water, and you talked to somebody, and he actually saved yeah. their life. Oh that was God. crazy. Like, I, forgot, was, I, I, say, I didn't yeah. forget about it, but it was crazy to see that. And she's saying, like, you know, like, they went, went to my wedding. Like, that's why I said he's such a good dude. Like, not just – Forget the basketball stuff, just a good person in general. Like Hubie Brown said, you'll never meet a family as good as the Gasol um, brothers or the Gasol family. And it, that, that documentary kind of showed it. So, yeah, just shout out. It was great. It was great. It was a great documentary for sure. Yeah, no, I think that was honestly like the St. Jude part and then the part about him going to the Mediterranean and then like saving uh, the woman in the water and how she's like, who is this tall dude like driving the boat? And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, he's an NBA player. Like, that's just not something, like, very hands-on. They said that man was driving the boat through the water looking for people for 10, 11 hours straight. And it's just, like, that really just shows the type of dude he was uh, just on and off the court, really. And I think sometimes we see, like, with NBA players, you almost want to be like, I wish they would do more. Like, nah, Mark Gasol understood, like, the platform that he had and the connection that he could have with people and decided to use that not only to, you know, give Grizzlies fans great, mem like, you know, great memories, whether it was, you know, signing autographs, stuff like that after games, but to go to, like, St. Jude and really change these kids' lives, saving people's lives. Like, she, like in the documentary, that the, the woman who he saved was talking about how, like, everybody else that she was with didn't make it, right? So she was the only one that made it, and... If it, and she and if it wasn't for him, she was like, I don't know how much longer I would have made it out there, right? So it's like that kind of stuff was really like the best part of the entire thing to me. And it just kind of shows you why there are so many people to this day that will never say 
anything bad about Mark Gasol, regardless of any any of the other stuff. Uh, and then getting to the end and seeing him, you know, when he actually did win the championship with the Raptors. Yeah, I was gonna say that too. Yeah. yeah, and then Tony Allen and Zach and them kind of talking about, and even Mike talking about how even though they didn't win it, you know, they were just happy for him. He had grit and grind engraved on the ring and everything, gave them a shout out at that. And I was like, okay, that was that was really awesome too. I really enjoyed that part. Uh, and then, yeah, and then also last thing too is the stuff with him and Jerry. Where they had they brought Jaron in, and Jaron talks about like his rookie year, and after the game against the Nets, which because I remember that game, I did too. Went, yeah, where Jaron <laughs> went crazy in the fourth quarter against the Nets, and he was making all these threes, and you know for him he's kind of like, you know, he's a rookie. He's like, I just scored thirty points. You know, we won the game. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Ball. He's happy, and they're coming to the locker room, and Mark Gasol is kicking the trash can because he's like, this is sustainable. We got to play better defense. We can't rely on a rookie to go for 30 and make seven threes every game if we want to win games. And it just and it just shows you, like, him being a perfectionist, but also him, like, understanding that, like, hey, like his basketball understanding being like, hey, we if we want to win games, like, this is not good enough, <laughs> right? We can't just rely on – like like he literally talked about like this like these are he's nineteen and he just he just he just got hot in the fourth quarter, uh. But then also him talking about them kind of you know reminiscing and all that, uh. And I think he did kind of impart a lot of that on to Jaron, and I think that's why like I really do like I'm always gonna be a big fan of Jaron too because it's almost like he is like him and even Dylan Brooks even though Dylan Brooks isn't on the Grizzlies anymore, it's like those two are like the children of grit and grind, right? Like they are the last ones that kind of got mentored by those guys and they played with those guys. And then now they're, you know, in veteran roles where they are now and they're older and they're now doing some of like, even though they're not as old, obviously, as Mark and Mike were when Jaron first came into the league, but they can do some of that same stuff with a guy like Gigi Jackson and they can explain stuff to him. And I think it's just like that basketball knowledge that came from, you know, obviously playing, but playing with people who played the right way, like Mark Gasol. I think that's just going it's, to, it's going to do wonders for them as they continue to go in their career. And then hopefully they will pay it forward when they get older as well. Uh, and they're about to leave the league and they can impart that same knowledge onto, you know, the younger generation. Somebody's probably in like fifth grade right now that they're going to be teaching. But uh, it was just awesome to see all that, and I'm really excited for the jersey retirement on Saturday. I think he definitely deserves it. Uh, and like I, and like you said earlier, it's not the last one. We should have at least two more of these coming up pretty soon. So, oh yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, we're gonna have two more. But you know, uh, yeah, and that's what I was referencing earlier in the pod, like the criticism, because like they said, and I remember when I was going through it at the time, especially closer to the end of his tenure. Like, people talk about Mark being an emotional guy and wearing his emotions on his sleeve because, like, a lot of documentary, it confirmed what we already knew at the time. Like, Fizz, him and Fizz, they're not getting along, him being emotional about – not emotional, but, like, angry about certain things, how things went about. And him, you know, having – not necessarily regrets, but, like, he said, I should have gone about it a different way. You know what I mean? And, you know, but, again, that's what made him him because at in the time, you know, he got criticism for being that emotional guy and, well, they said he's pouting, but like you said, like he cared about the process. Like that's why he was always big on it. He's process oriented because he understood if you're pro- and I'm big on that. Y'all heard me say process needs to be good because, like he said, at the end of the day, if your process is good, you're going to get good results at the end, especially when you get to the playoffs. But if your process is bad, it's going to always come back to bite you. And I understand that now as you get older and um, just doing, you know, especially if you play, watch basketball, do all that. Even coach at that time, you understand what he's saying. And then you understand even more why he was still the way he was even at the end because they're on two different timelines. Like we were talking about with Jaron. Like Jaron even said, I understand kind of how he is now getting older because especially this year he understands, like even though Jaron's 24, but he understands now where why Mark was so urgent about that because they needed – they were trying to win. It, we weren't trying to develop young guys, and that's no disrespect to Mark, but that wasn't what he's trying to – he's trying to win. 
and you know, and you couldn't win with young guys because they need reps to play. And that's the that's the hard thing to bridge when you got older guys. And so, you know, that type of stuff, you know, where you know, Mark gets criticism for that. Like you kind of, I'm not saying you know he couldn't, like he said, he could have gone about it a different way. But you you can't really blame him because again, even Tayshawn Prince said it. Like not every like he told Mark, not everybody's gifted as you IQ wise. They don't see it just like you do as quick as you, or they might never see it as you. So you have to understand it. You got to talk to him a different way because like he even said, Mark said he said certain things to teammates like you know in a bad way because like they didn't understand his IQ because he was so smart like they couldn't understand it and it happens you know and so. But again, like that's just part of it. And again, it's good to see everything in totality because again, it's, it's good to just look back at it. But yeah, like just for Mark, at least, you know, again, he didn't lead. Like it, it never came. I think Jason Marks is the coach now for the G League team. He's like I said, he never did it maliciously. It wasn't like he did it because he hated the person. He did it because he wanted to win. He's a competitor. That's what they, the biggest thing. Is. He hated to lose. He hated to lose so much. Like he was the guy that he can't lose and just forget about it like even Brevin Knight was saying it like some people just lose and they okay they can you know come from, you know mentalize it right there and they'd be like okay we're good like they understand it okay and then they move on Mark's not gonna move on he gonna sit with it the whole offseason all that maybe to the first day of training camp but again all this stuff made him him and that's why he getting his number retired that's why he's always gonna be remembered in Memphis that's why he's always gonna be remembered and even NBA like you said they had Kevin Randall here like it was crazy. You're not crazy to see Kevin Randall here, but like you said, it's a little bit surprising to see Kevin Randall here because, you know, you, you didn't expect that, you know. Um, and even he said they were a dynasty type team because, you know, they didn't win to see those guys that, to see those guys, that group of guys that get together that long and had that much success. You don't really see that in today's NBA. And again, a, 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 you know, it, it doesn't happen, but that's hopefully what you have now. Like with Jod, Darren, and Bain, you hopefully see those guys here for the next eight to ten years maybe i guess you if you want you know some people are high on gg you can throw him in there too i gotta see it but again you know hope health pending and all that that's what you hope this era is and like what mark said i think the last thing that i'll touch on is the thing that i liked a lot was like him picturing a a, a parade on memphis and the picture of it like his vision of how the parade would look on memphis i was like dang i was like we really need that <laughs> i usually don't be like that i was like dang I was like, I'm hoping they can get it done somehow, some way. It ain't got to be right next year. But I'm like, man, they, we got to lock in. Because it's like, man, that'd be great. Because trust, if they – listen, let the, let this team win a championship. I will be there. Even though – listen, that little parade thing, I'll be – listen, that little picture, you'll see me there. I don't know where I'll be at, but I'll be in that little crowded area or whatever on Bill Street. Don't know where. Hey, if we win the – chip, if, if the Grizzlies win the championship, you going to be on the bus. We putting you – <laughs> we putting you up there with Mark on the bus, bro. Mark, Mark, get look. The whole core four gets to be at the parade too. Oh, care. everybody! They, they man, gonna be at the parade. They, like if it it, it it would be a, a good sight to see. Uh, and yeah, I like that part too. I thought that was pretty cool. Kind of like his vision and everything of what it could look like and everything. And then to end it with him actually kind of getting that obviously in Toronto uh, and seeing like he really. He he enjoyed the parade. I'll say that he definitely enjoyed that parade. I remember, <laughs> I remember when it happened too. Uh, but yeah, just to end, like Mark Gasol, congratulations getting his jersey retired. Very excited for that coming up this weekend. Grizzlies also going to be playing the Pistons this weekend, so that'll be cool. I mean, they just played them the other night and it went down to the wire, so we'll see if it'll be something similar to that too. Uh, but. Just, I'm really excited for the jersey retirement. I'm excited to see his number go up in the rafters next to Zebo. It's really fitting that him and Zebo are the first two, because I mean, obviously, those were the two that really I feel like got everything started. Uh, because even when they had Mark and they had Mike, but it was really that combo of having Mark and Zebo together that made them so tough to beat, man. Uh, but as always, I appreciate everybody who listened to this week's episode here on the Bluff City Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Bryson Wright. I was joined by my co-host, Alex Witten, and we will see y'all next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Gen Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and a comment wherever you download your podcasts. Head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co 
where you will find comprehensive coverage of all things Memphis sports and how you can become an insider. We'll see you back here next time.